Hey Zwifters, I'm Simon Schofield and welcome to the Zwiftcast. In this episode, Zwift history maker Rachel Elliott talks us through winning a race. I just kept pushing all the way and was really, really happy to win at the end. How the backlash hurt. Yeah, I did get upset and I, I, I responded with comments to show that I was upset. But how the rest of the community cheered her up particularly the women who supported me. There's a a Facebook group for ladies who's with, and there's been some absolutely fantastic support in there, which I'm very, very grateful for. And a little more Zwift history. You must have noticed G Master in game. On this episode... He talks. Are you kind of friends with all the blue guys? Uh, they are pretty friendly, yep. Um, they're what you could call staff or maybe, you know, minions. OK, there's more to this than meets the ear, but you'll have to keep listening to find out what. Belgium is the spiritual home of cycling. It's a nation that's obsessed with the sport. With the spring classic season about to kick off, I've got an interview with a man who's got his finger firmly on the pulse of Belgian Zwifting. And how do you fancy a 20% plus increase in your FTP? I'd take that. One Zwifter tells us how his dedicated and disciplined approach to the FTP Builder programme has seen his numbers rocket. What was your FTP before you started and what was it after you finished? I was at 158 and I got to 196. So let's start this episode in the customary fashion, which is having a short discussion uh, about the kinds of things that are being said on the Facebook groups. They've been as vibrant as ever. Um, And I'm joined this week by John Hampton, and I'm going to ask John to introduce himself. John, who are you? Well, my name is John. You figured that part out so far. I'm a newer cyclist. I've been riding for about a year. I got started. I lost a lot of weight, about 120 pounds um, a couple years ago and thought that I should get more into physical fitness and cycling seemed fun enough. And what was intended to just be something to do a couple times a week to get my heart pumping uh, turned out to be quite a passion. I like to uh, do something on my trainer indoors, so that's what I started with Swift. Well, congratulations on the weight loss and, and congratulations on finding the passion for cycling. Now, one thing that caught my eye, John, was one of your contributions to the groups. And um, it was a debate which which has come up before, really, about whether Zwift is real cycling. Um, but you had a really interesting, fresh take on it, which um, I'm going to christen your no true Scotsman theory. Um, tell me about your no true Scotsman theory. Yeah, so No True Scotsman is an established informal fallacy, essentially something that if you were going to write an academic paper um, that your professor might say this isn't acceptable because this is a No True Scotsman fallacy. It's an unqualified statement that intends to discredit something else um, but doesn't itself actually have any value. And so the idea behind that was to kind of apply that to uh, to this argument about Zwift, this argument that, that indoor training doesn't count, that the miles don't count, and basically the same idea is there, that what we're really trying to do is discredit the value of somebody else's effort. Uh, in other words, rather than saying, you know, Zwift is effective or ineffective, we're just saying that what you're doing doesn't count, only what I does counts. I mean, we hear it all the time. If you ride the wrong brand, if you ride the wrong kind of riding, if you have, I mean, it gets silly. If you have a saddlebag on your bike, you're not a real cyclist, you know. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's a very uh, attractive theory, this one. I'm, I'm liking this a lot because um, there's all kinds of things that no true Scotsman would ever do in the eyes of another true Scotsman, of course. And, and, and the same obviously applies, I think, to cyclists. Um, I sensed, uh, looking at the debate on Facebook, that the people who were claiming that Zwift miles are not real miles were really pretty much firmly in a minority. It seems like most of the time when this comes up, it's someone has been hurt or offended by 
perhaps a mate of theirs. You know, they say that I was talking with some of my club members and they were telling me that I shouldn't be putting my Zwift rides on, on Strava, right? Um, so a lot of times the comment isn't even coming from our group. Uh, it's coming from outside the group and is getting debated. And certainly it's in a minority when you're talking to a bunch of other people who use Zwift. Um, the attitude seems to come from people who maybe live in milder climates and get to spend most of their time riding outside. Uh, so for them, Zwift is just a way to kill boredom, uh, not really a training tool. You know, using um, real training metrics to kind of settle this debate once and for all. And um, TSS is is a, a set of initials that people who are used to training with power will know something about. But but a lot of new Zwifters won't know what TSS is. So just um, explain what that is to us and why you think it's useful in this debate. Yeah, so TSS is a term coined by Andrew Kogan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right or not. I've only read it, never heard it spoken. But uh, he's a, a very well-educated um, sports, uh, sports scientist, and he coined the term training stress score. And essentially, it's to simplify it, it's adding up all the effort you do on your bike and giving you a number. It has nothing to do with miles. It's not affected by hill. It's not affected by wind. It's purely how much force your muscles put out over a given ride. Um, he talks about it in his book, Training and Racing with a Power Meter, uh, which is something anybody who rides with a power meter, even if that's just Z-Power and Zwift, uh, ought to read. But basically, it's, it's a much better metric than miles. So the debate comes down right to whether or not um, we can count 30 miles on Zwift or 100 miles on Zwift, like a century, um, uh, if we can count that and compare that to an outdoor ride. But I think if we ignore the miles and focus on TSS, um, which again, just takes how much force you actually put through the pedals in a given amount of time, I think we can do a lot better job of actually comparing our indoor and outdoor efforts. And I think it'll benefit the cyclist because they'll figure out whether or not they need to do more miles uh, or less miles indoors to get the same sort of training effort. Mm -hmm. Now, TSS, I think, is a trademarked term, but but you see the, the metric used extremely widely. For instance, Strava's version of of TSS is simply called training load but but for mm -hmm. me for me the, the, the really interesting thing about this metric is it, it's the complete clincher in the argument as to whether being on Zwift counts in in any real sense either miles or hours or training benefit because if you've got a if you're lucky enough to have a power meter on your bike outside and a power meter on Zwift then all you need to do is a couple of rides and compare the TSS scores for for each one and and you will soon understand Understand that, of course, Zwift has training benefit. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we call it the Zwift effect sometimes, and that's even been controversial, right? Somebody posts about Zwift effect, and and folks have gotten upset about that. But the idea being that uh, on Zwift, we're able to put up so much training suffer score because it helps us, or training uh, stress score rather, um, because it uh, it just helps us be motivated to ride harder. And uh, so we're faster outdoors, right? So it's, it's clear that it has a training benefit if our outdoor performance is better after using Zwift, or at least the same instead of less uh, compared to cyclists who don't train in the winter. I, I think we've rehearsed that one uh, quite well and uh, uh, made some good points. And, and people should should get their heads around TSS if, if they can, because it's a, it's a very useful metric. Um, let, let's get a bit more lighthearted. I've noticed um, on the groups that uh, something that's been christened the Fort Bragg Police have been in <laughs> uh, have been in operation. Um, uh, I think this might be an American thing, John. So I think you should take the lead on this. Uh, who and what are the Fort Bragg Police? Well, Fort Bragg is a military um, base in the United States. Um, so what we're really doing is just taking advantage of the name that sounds a lot like Bragg, like bragging. Um, Fort Bragg is in North Carolina, and uh, it's uh, it's of course like anything else, like any other city um, in the United States, military. Um, installments are often surrounded by a municipal city. That's just like any other city, uh, and uh, and it's got Fort Bragg police. So whenever somebody posts an obvious brag, oftentimes they'll form the brag in the in the context of a question, like "Is an FTP of six thousand good?" You know, <laughs> something really silly like that. Someone will, of course, inevitably post a picture of the Fort Bragg police's insignia. Uh, I guess indicating that they're being cited for bragging. Yeah. Now, do we think the Fort Bragg police should be called for the people who proudly post their metric century? Oh, OK. Good question. Yeah. I mean, you know, it kind of goes back to that original argument, right? Because folks are getting upset or offended or are otherwise bothered by the idea that 
people are proud of their indoor achievements. And so somebody who has been out, I think what it really comes down to is somebody who's been out in, in uh, you know, below freezing temperatures uh, in the snow or in the rain um, who comes in and they've done 15 miles and they see their, their friend has, has done 15 miles on Zwift in a, in a, in a heated basement. Um, you know, they kind of feel like they've been slighted, like their, uh, their contributions to the sport aren't as well appreciated. So, you know, I think that temptation is there to do the same thing when people brag on on Zwift groups and just kind of say, you know, do your own thing and don't tell us about it. Um, personally, it doesn't bother me, uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, we do kind of see that, don't we? If uh, if folks get really proud of their achievements, uh, one of the running jokes is that uh, seems like every couple of days somebody has to post that they've completed a century, and they'll post a screenshot of the century, and and uh, yeah, that really seems to bother some people. Yeah, and to be honest, I'm not one of them actually. You know, I think if somebody's uh, achieved something and they feel sufficiently strongly to post it on Facebook, it's probably because it's the first time that they've done it. You know, if somebody's done it for the first time, then kind of why shouldn't they be allowed to post a picture of it is my uh, my view on that. Sure, and I think like anything else, there's there's someone who's proud to have done something for the first time, and then there's, there's the obnox- obnoxious stuff, right? We call it like a humble brag. You know, people who say, wow, this is my third century, this is getting easy. You know, that... That might be a little annoying, but uh, but even then, I mean, you know, if somebody wants to be proud of themselves, and I'll be proud of them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, keep keep posting. I would say to uh, to the first time or even the tenth time metric century makers. Uh, I think I think they uh, they should be allowed to have a little uh, a little brag without the police being involved. I'm thinking that we might have a little moan and it may very well be outdated by the time that the Zwiftcast um, is published but I would sort of expected to see the group ride module arrive by now um, and mm-hmm. and there's no sign of it um, what do you think do you think that, uh, and have Zwift HQ gone very quiet have you noticed much evidence of them on the groups I saw John Mayfield post uh, the other night in, in, in fact, the debate about whether it was real miles or not. But uh, mm-hmm. it, all, it all seems a bit a bit quiet from Zwift HQ. What, what, what do you make of that? Well, I've had one conversation with John um, in, uh, in, a, in a one-on-one sense, a short, short conversation. And I know it, it sounds for me, I hope, I hope if he's listening, he's not thinking I'm way off base, but it sounds to me like um, Zwift is, is so much more than they expected it to be in terms of popularity. And their team is quite small compared to what mm. a typical piece of software like this has. So they may, be, they may be a little too anxious or too aggressive in their marketing, suggesting that things are going to happen that they really have no means to complete on time. So I'm, I'm less worried about it myself i don't think that they're twiddling their thumbs or sitting on their hands i, I think maybe just they've they've uh, underestimated how much work these sort of things take but mm. uh it is something that the that we desperately need there's a lot of complaints and issues with races and group riding that i think could be solved by that module mm-hmm. and, and to be fair to them they don't actually promise it's only people like me and some of the more enthusiastic posters on the group who are, who kind of create almost uh, and you know i take my fair share of blame for this take a kind of um, expectation that Zwift have never actually um, um, signed up to. They've always said that these things take time. So, yeah, sure. yeah you know, I guess probably we should uh, we should cut them a bit of slack. Um, finally, there was a post I found very amusing um, from one guy who said that um, um, so bad was his. And, and, and the phrase OCD gets used here. And I know people get upset by that because it is actually a misuse of what can be a very serious condition but I think when we say OCD to each other as cyclists we kind of know um, what we mean even though it's arguably not the best use of the term um, sure. but, but but he did say that um, all his rides had to finish bang on the start finish line and, and I wonder if um, if that particular kind of pedanticness or pedantry i'm not sure the quite right the 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 right word is is something that's particularly um associated with cyclists wow yeah i don't know um i don't know if that's something that that we get to claim as cyclists or if that's just a a mental thing i mean you know when we ride outside we kind of don't have a choice do we i mean we have to get back to the car or back to the house right i mean you can't you can't ride 30 miles away and say gee i'm tired i guess i'll quit now Mm. unless you're planning on sleeping on the side of the road 
Um, so maybe that's almost just so ingrained. Um, it just feels weird to not stop where you started. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that's a good point. But I, I have to confess, I'm very fussy about my bike outside. I mean, I, I've, I, I nearly once bought, I managed to uh, resist um, the complete waste of money, it no doubt would have been. But I nearly bought a laser gizmo that would have ensured that my stem was completely centered to the last tenth of a millimeter to uh, <laughs> to the front wheel and um you know all this stuff about when you photograph your bike the pedals should be at uh, at at, at, uh, at nine o'clock and you know we do we, we are quite fussy i think as a as a tribe absolutely yeah i uh, i posted uh uh my my new bike that i just recently bought on uh on the Zwift group and, and it was a, um, and I, I don't, I don't hold any grudge here. Actually, I thought it was funny, but, uh, it was a mail order bike. So I had, I, nothing was even done up yet. Right. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of all just loose. So of course, you know, the, the, the hoods were pointing sky high. The saddle was <laughs> angle was off. It was on the little ring. And I mean, the comments came flooding in. Nobody was happy that I got a new bike. They were all worried that I didn't have it set up just yet for the picture. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a very, uh, that was a very dangerous post that I yeah. would say. Well, I think my, my favorite response, though, was that taking a picture of your bike when it isn't set up correctly is like taking a picture of your wife when she hasn't gotten out of bed yet. So, uh, <laughs> I like yeah, we, that. we are. Yeah. So, no, we're, we're certainly a fussy bunch. Um, excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. I very much enjoyed talking to you, and uh, I'll uh, see you on the island. Well, thank you, Simon. Given the vagaries of dozens of different types of trainers in Zwift, doubt about other people's performances is pretty inevitable. The doubt thing gets thrown into sharper focus in the racing arena, and sometimes that doubt is expressed publicly. It may be right to do that, but sometimes it's wrong. In Rachel Elliott's case, the doubt was misplaced. Over the course of the next few minutes, you can hear what effect that had on Rachel. Now, Rachel Elliott is a bit famous because she became the first woman to win a Zwift race in a field dominated by men. And she's with me now. Hi, Rachel. Hi there. Let's start with some basics. What was the race? Um, it was the um, Monday night kiss race, which was held on the um, Watopia circuit that was and it was five reverse laps so it was quite a long race I think it's obviously only the first one I've done but I think it was one of the longer races that's been held yes it was a bit of a shock <laughs> wow well we'll we'll get to your your win in a minute I mean how I mean I know it's it's quite difficult to tell particularly if it was your first race but how big do you think the field was um I've actually got no idea I was a bit of an amateur when I started and um, I was a bit late going to the warm-up line, basically, because I'd done a warm-up, shut, shut Swift down, um, booted it up again, yeah. got to the start line a bit late. But um, as far as I could see, there were probably around 40 or 50 riders, I would be guessing. And yeah. look at the results afterwards, that's, that's about what it seems to be. But I certainly started right at the back. I missed the go, so I was chasing, chasing from the off. <laughs> Wow. Well, I, you know, that's a very decent field and, and I would expect a field of around that size for those KISS races. Um, so you won. I mean, you know, let me ask you the traditional question. How did you feel? Um, well, I was, I was really happy. I was quite surprised. Um, I don't use a keyboard when I'm Zwifting um, and um, I've got a, a television which is quite a long way away from the bike. So I couldn't actually see quite what was going on. So I couldn't see any comments and I just um, rode as hard as I could. I thought I was in the lead um, and I could see a couple of guys chasing for about two laps and then I just seemed to be on my own. So I was, I was really, really happy and I, I just kept pushing all the way and was really, really happy to win at the end. Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not surprised and, and, and massive congratulations from the Zwift cast. Um, now, there, there's this phrase that crops up when uh, women riders do very well and I'd just like to get your view on it. Uh, all the lady riders I've spoken to have never had a problem with it. But when a, 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 a woman beats a man, it, there's this phrase and it, the man is uh, said to have been chicked um have you heard that and what's your what's your view on the use of that 
Um, I have heard it a lot. I, I, I've come from a running background and um, that certainly used to be the phrase in races when, when you beat all the men then you've been chicked. And I, I first heard it about 10 years ago and it's, it's quite a laughable phrase. And I just think it does stem from the fact women are biologically um, never going to be as strong as men. They don't have the testosterone. We've got estrogen, they've got testosterone. So biologically, we're not meant to beat the men. And I think it, it does come as a surprise when we do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but personally, I, th- I think it's actually quite a friendly phrase. And, and, and I think, but, you know, both men and women take it in, in good heart. But, oh, but you know, you, you're definitely the queen of the, of the chicked <laughs> Yes, it uh, seems thing to be. on Zwift. Um, tell us about your your real life riding. I mean, you're clearly a very strong rider. Yes, I mean, I, as I say, I started running from nothing in about 2005, and quickly found out I was a pretty good runner. Um, I sort of got down to about 36 minutes for 10k and 120 for a half. Um, my main issue with running was I've always been quite muscular, and I was always too heavy, really, to make sort of the cut to sort of being elite runner. Um, and I, I had to go cycling. And I, in my very early days, I cycled up Alpe d'Huez in France. And this was when I'd not really done any cycling training at all and found out I was quite fast. And the, the strength I've got in my muscles translated very well to cycling. Um, and an injury in running meant I, I sort of switched to cycling. And the natural discipline to go to was time trialing. Um, because it's sort of racing yourself, you're, you're, there's nobody else to race, you're just going as fast as you can. Um, and I soon found out I was doing quite well and I had a year racing. Um, and then unfortunately for me, I had some cardiac problems. Um, I actually blacked out on the bike um, and um, I had to take three years off um, completely because I was blacking out sort of two or three times a day um, and switched to the turbo during that time. That was pretty much all I could do. So I was doing sort of two to three hours a day every day on the turbo with no racing. Um, And that sort of got me quite strong. Um, I'm now fully recovered and I came back last year and and started time trialing again last year. Um, And again, I I started to do quite well. And um, I broke the national 30 mile record back in October. Um, So that was the sort of culmination of a good year. I had a very good day on the course um and for me i rode very well i had good power for the whole race um and sort of won sort of won the ladies and broke the record in an hour and three minutes for 30 miles so wow i think i think the the swift race on monday was pretty much the same length as that and i think an hour is sort of my optimum race time and race distance so um, i was really really pleased to um get that record and hopefully this year i'm going to do more more on the time training scene and, and break some more records. That would be nice. Mm, mm. <laughs> well, I mean, clearly, by, by, by the sound of your cycling heritage, you're kind of almost perfectly set up for, 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 for the Zwift racing, which tends to be about an hour long, often, yes. often on a fairly flat course, would actually favour time trialists, I would have thought. Um, yes, and that's uh, exactly how I rode the race on Monday. I sort of just time trialed the whole way. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> now, I think your average power for the, for the race was what, about 300 watts? Yeah, it was about, yeah, about 300 watts, I think just over, but about 300. And it certainly tailed off towards the end as my legs started to cramp. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and you're only, you're only what, 60, 62 kilos, I think? Yes, um, yeah, about that at the moment. So. so that gives us a kind of rough, you know, around about five watts per kilogram, which is obviously a, an, an excellent pace. And, and you can sustain that, can't you? Yeah, I sort of can keep it going. I mean, um, one thing I don't have is a sort of very, very good sprint ability. So I think people commented I, I was riding like a time trial. I just ride at a very consistent pace for the whole race. So, yes, that's sort of what, I, what I'm good at, just holding a pace down. And I think that's what comes of training on a turbo for so long is mm. being able to just hold this consistent pace. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, now, speaking of turbos, what's, what's your setup? How do, how do you run Zwift? Um, well, I've got a um, Tax Vortex. Um, I did have a few problems at the start, sort of making sure the power was right because I, I run it with a power tap wheel, so I make sure they're mostly both fully um, matching all the time. And um, I've, I've also tested it with SRMs, so I know it's mm. very accurate. And I, I, I sort of test it once a week or so to check the calibration is completely right. Um, so it is a smart trainer, and obviously I've got the hills emulated, so. Um, yeah, I'm running it with that, and I've just got a standard um, desktop PC which I use mm. um, to run Swift on. So, 
Mm. I've got quite an old bike I attach it to, but yes. <laughs> mm. Well, I mean, it's, the vortex, when, when properly calibrated, can be extremely accurate, but to calibrate it against a power meter is, is just about the perfect way of doing it, I think. Yeah, so it, and it seems to be work very well. I mean, I, I ran it for a couple of hours a week or so ago against an SRM and it was actually the power was actually slightly lower than the SRM so mm. I'm pretty sure it's accurate yeah <laughs> yeah yeah me too now uh, this is pertinent because in some of the farther reaches of the Facebook groups and you know with some pretty ill-informed comments there were one or two people questioning your win um how did you respond to that um I'm not a very confident person when it comes to cycling. And um, initially, when I read the comments, I, I did get quite upset. I think it's quite a natural thing for many people to do. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I sort of, yeah, I did get upset and I, I, I responded with, with comments to show that I was upset. Um, but then I started to get so much support from people, it, it turned things around a bit. And, and when I put it into perspective myself, um, I actually thought, hang on, these people are, if they haven't done their research on me, they are going to think these things. It, it does look slightly strange when a woman who no one's heard of, and I really, really genuinely don't expect anyone to have heard of me, to just roll up in a race and um, push out five watts per kilogram and win it. It's, it's not something which you'd expect a woman to do. So um, I fully understand why, why people made those comments. And I know there's one person in particular who made quite an open comment and thinking about it, I actually don't blame him. It was a rant and he, that's what he thought. So I, I, I can't really blame him for, for making those comments. Um, and I'm guilty of it myself. I was on Zwift yesterday and I, I had the fastest overall lap for a while. And um, within about five minutes, somebody beat it. And I thought, oh, you know, they're not on a proper power meter. And um, I thought, hang on, um, this is the same treatment people were giving to me. And when I looked, they were on a proper power meter. They had um, I think they were on a, a I, I don't know, it wasn't a smart trainer, it was actually a, a proper power meter. And I thought, no, they've genuinely got that fastest lap. So I think we're all guilty of thinking of it. And I, I can't really blame him. But um, I think people just need to think a bit before they blame and, and perhaps do a bit of research. It doesn't take much to put Rachel Elliott cycling into google and yeah. see all my results come yeah, up so, absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. well i think that's a very balanced um response because yeah. because you know that the, the, they were that was a stupid comment in hindsight if if, if it, an even basic level of research had had been done yeah. um but on the upside there was this fantastic outpouring of support for you as well yes there was and i, I think it's, it's it's great to see and um i think the person who was second in the race um, was one of the most supportive people, and I'm I'm very grateful to him for his support. Mm. Um, and it turns out we've actually done time trials together ourselves in the past, so um, he, we sort of do know each other, if only from a result sheet. And I, I I do think it's great, and and particularly the women who've supported me as well. There's a there's another sort of sub Facebook group for for ladies who's whiffed. And there's been some absolutely fantastic support in there, which I'm very, very grateful for. So, mm, mm. so it's, it's actually been great from that perspective. Yeah, no, I can imagine that. Now, um, as you, you might know, Zwift currently has a talent search in conjunction with the women's pro team, um, Canyon Shram. Um, are you tempted? Um, I mean, I didn't join Zwift because of that. I, 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 was one, I joined in December, so I'm quite a new joiner, but not very new. But, but um, when I saw that, it was obviously very interesting to me and... Um, it's, it's definitely something I can pursue. And I mean, whether or not it's me, I think it's it's great that they are doing it. And it's something which will really help to promote cycling amongst women. So I think it's a it's a really, really great thing to do. And and, and could your hat be going in the ring, Rachel? Oh, it might well be. We'll have to see. But um, <laughs> I, I, as I say, I think it's, it's a great opportunity. And I mean, my main aim now is just to enjoy cycling and, and see where it takes me. I mean, I, I love cycling. I love training. I love racing. I mean, Monday, I was really, really looking forward to that race all day. I couldn't wait to get home and, and race. So mm. um, we'll, we'll just see just see how it goes. Mm, interesting. Now, I, I gather some of the teams on Zwift are, are competing for your signature. Yes, they are. I think probably nearly every single team has contacted me. Um, and I really hate letting people down. So I'm, I'm sort of looking at everything at the moment. And I, I, I hate saying no to anyone. Um, so... As a time trialer, I'm quite a solitary person, so we'll have to see. But I'm, I'm staying as a um, 
just an unattached harrier at the moment, as, as you call it in running, and, and just just doing my own thing. Uh, well, well, it must be it must be great to uh, to be in such demand. You're obviously going to carry on racing. Oh yes, yes, and I've got, I've got quite sort of big plans this year in the real life world. So so we'll have to see. But um, um, on Swift, I, I will give it another go. It's 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 shaken me a bit, I have to say, the, my first experience. Um, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be back. So. Mm, mm. Well, I, I hope it hasn't shaken you too much because, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think what people have to remember about about Zwift is the social nature of it can, like all social media, be, uh, you know, have the potential to be a double edged sword and for the, the minority and, and frankly, rather stupid opinion to to attract more weight than it than it merits. So, you know, I think ninety nine point nine percent of Swifters will be fully behind you, Rachel. I'm, I'm sure of that. Oh, that's great to hear. Mm, mm. Well, congratulations on your win. Um, I'll certainly be looking out for you and, and probably not getting anywhere near you in the races if we, if we competed together. But very well done. That's a fantastic win and a bit of Zwift history. Thank you very much. Now, my next guest is a veritable Zwift superstar, and the fact is I've been trying to persuade him to appear for months and months, and finally, he's agreed. Uh, welcome to the Zwift cast, G Master. Hey, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Simon. Hey, so Mr. Master, are, are you speaking to us live from Watopia? I wish I was, but you know what? Today, they've given me the day off at Zwift, so I'm, I'm taking an easy break before the long weekend ahead. Who are you? But I'm, I'm really just like you. I'm just like everyone else, except, uh, you know, maybe a little bit less hair. People, people speculate about your, your role and, 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 and the reason for you being there. I mean, let, you know, let's, let's, let's ask you, first of all, are you kind of friends with all the blue guys? Do you have some kind of relationship with them? Uh, they are pretty friendly. Yep. Um, they're what you could call staff or maybe, you know, minions. Either one works. So they, they do your bidding? They do, yes. Uh, and what would that bidding be, Mr. Master? Well, they just uh, they keep the, the course interesting, they keep the course competitive, they keep everybody out there riding, and they give a challenge to those riders who want to push hard. Mm, but but, but you, I, I see you're, you're, you're kind of skirting around the issue of, of what it is exactly that you do, Mr. Master. What do I do? Well, I survey the land, I watch the trends and make sure that everyone out, is out there having a good time. I bring my blue friends to the course, again, to keep things competitive and interesting. And I'm really looking out for some new interesting places in the course where I can pave some roads. I see. Okay, so you're kind of a Zwift spy and and simultaneously some kind of controller? Something like that. Yeah, that works. Hmm. Okay, let's try something easier. M Mr. G Master, wh what is your first name? I knew you were going to ask me that, but I'm going to have to leave a little mystery to you. It's it's Game G, or you can make up whatever you want. Okay, Game Master. I, I I think we're beginning to get some clues now. Listen, whenever I see you, you're you're just kind of hanging out. You're you're rarely riding. Do you, do you ever get bored? No, it's not boring at all. It's uh it's fun to actually just watch the other riders driving on the course. I like to see the races when they start. It's it's a fun time. Hmm. Now, when you do disappear, should should we be worried? Is that like some kind of kind of portent of doom? <laughs> not at all, not at all, Simon. Usually, when I disappear, it's just because I'm going back to the table at Swift and I'm giving them some ideas and giving them some feedback for the next set of features that are going to go into the product. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I think at this point we should probably reveal the joke, which I'm sure that most listeners have already rumbled, really. You're, you're not the real G Master. In fact, you're David Desrosiers, and you're, you're one of the most technically clued up guys in the whole of Zwift. And we're going to get onto that in, in a minute. And actually not, uh, well, you kind of are a real game master, if not the G Master. Um, have you told us, David, everything that we think we know about G Master? Uh, I, th I think I have. Yeah. I, most of it's really just uh, some guesswork and some speculation. John is really the person who knows the most about what the role of G Master is and what it will evolve into. Yeah, that's that's John, May John Mayfield, the uh, the creator of Zwift. 
That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm hoping to get John onto the Zwiftcast at some point, and that will certainly be amongst the, amongst the questions that I ask him. Well, listen, thanks for for helping us to kind of explain what what the role of GMaster is, but. More importantly for now, let's talk about your brilliant new resource for Zwifters, which is the knowledge base. And let's start, first of all, by telling people where they can find it. Sure. So the knowledge base is easy to find. If you just go to kb.swiftwriters.com, it's right there. Okay. Now, what is it? Actually, the knowledge base is a curation of uh, a lot of other questions that have been brought up in the Swift Riders Facebook group time and time again. And it seems like there are a lot of those new new users will be coming into the group with the same kinds of questions over and over and over. So I've just kind of assembled all those questions and those answers and added some screenshots and put them in one place so that we can refer those users to it. They can search for it. They can find their own answers instead of having post after post after post, you know, repeated in, inside the Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. And, and, and does it tend towards the technical uh, it can be a little bit technical, but there's some fun posts in there, too. I've I've seeded the content with a little bit of humor here and there. And the intention has always been that I would create sort of the, the momentum behind it. But anybody can log in and create their own articles. They can create their own knowledge base articles for, for anything that they want. Mm. And what are the most popular, popular areas that, that, that people are asking about that your knowledge base is able to solve? It's interesting. Most recently, it's been about the performance of Zwift itself, about the application. Um, but a lot of the technical stuff tends to be around connecting the mobile apps to Zwift and how to get screenshots done and how to do ride-ons. That seems to be the most uh, popular uh, articles hit. Sure, sure. Uh, and I, I know a recent one that's been insanely popular, uh, certainly in my household, because it's managed to double my frame rate. Um, first of all, for, for those who are not as well technically informed as, 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 as we know you are, just, just talk to us about frame rate and why it's important, what it means. Sure, sure, absolutely. So when you're playing Zwift, the, the amount of data that's coming at you from the client and from the server side actually requires that your screen refresh itself to paint new riders on the screen, to repaint positions of buildings and trees as you're moving along the road. If your machine is not fast enough to repaint that screen quick enough, you're going to get sort of a flip book effect of, of Zwift, and that's no fun. You want it to be as realistic as possible to look like the real world, just like you're riding down the road. And so higher frame rates typically will result in a better experience overall with Zwift. Lower end machines don't tend to have fast graphics hardware, so the frame rates are a little bit lower, and higher end machines are admittedly more expensive, and, and will give you those frame rates. But not everybody is in that in that level. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you, I mean, I don't think we need to describe the, the, the tweaks uh, uh, in this forum because obviously the knowledge base is is actually a much better medium for for communicating what what people have to do. But there's two tiny little tweaks that you've done that really seem to be helping people. Yes, there's actually two very simple tweaks that you can do. Um, mostly right now it's for the NVIDIA cards, and I'm working on adding support for the Intel and the, and the Radeon cards with the help of the community. The great thing about the knowledge base is that there's a kind of real step-by-step, dead easy uh, procedure to follow to do those two little tweaks. And I think that kind of sums up the beauty of the knowledge base, really, in that there's all that technical expertise which clearly resides in you, but it's presented in a really nice clear user-friendly fashion and people can perhaps just follow the steps without possibly understanding everything that they might otherwise need to understand about how computers work that's exactly right and that's the way that i talk i just just as if there was somebody in front of me that i was walking through that process that's how i write my content just top bottom add screenshots along the way so it's not confusing at all there's about 150 articles today, uh, and a lot of them do link back to the, the Zwift manual on Titanium Geek. It links back to the Facebook groups for various posts. It's it's really just a, an aggregation and a curation of all the content that we've built up since the beta period. Well, I've used it. It, it has personally doubled my frame rate, for which I am extremely grateful uh, to you and your knowledge base for. Uh, it would be great to see it continue to grow, and I think I'm going to finish this, David, with... Um, with a personal vote of thanks on behalf of the whole community for, for devoting time to helping solve problems, which, you know, people can find frustrating. You're more than welcome. I'm, you know, I'm here to help. I've got some expertise. I'm happy to share it. And I'm learning along the way as well. Excellent. So one more time, where do we find it? kb.zwiftriders.com. Okay, not difficult. Excellent. David, thank you very much for the time you put into it. Thank you very much for telling us what little we know about about the mysterious G Master. And uh, thank you very much for uh, being a contributor to the Swiftcast. Thanks for having me, Simon. (laughs) 
David's just one more example of how the Zwift community bends over backwards to help other Zwifters, and it's always good to see. But the next feature is all about self-help. Nobody can do your training for you. So if you decide to embark on one of the training programs, what kind of results can you expect? Well, to an extent, it depends where you start. Very fit riders will find gains harder to achieve. But if you're starting with an FTP that's relatively low, and I don't mean that unkindly, then you can see big gains quickly. That's what Mark Kirby found. So welcome to the Zwiftcast to Mark Kirby. And Mark's one of uh, a, a whole load of people, I, I think, who are uh, completing the 12-week FTP builder program. And I thought it'd be really good to check in with somebody who's rec- who's managed to get through the whole program and recorded a fairly significant increase in FTP and find out just how painful the whole process was. So um, welcome, Mark. Let's uh, Let's get the important stuff first. What was your FTP before you started and what was it after you finished? Well, back in August was when I did my first one and I was at 158. And then I did my last FTP test last month and I got to 196. Wow, that's a fantastic improvement. Now, how much of that improvement do you think is down solely to the to the 12 week FTP builder program? Um, I think most of it, because I started back in August with Trainer Road doing their sort of base training workouts. Yeah. Lost a lot of time due to throwing my back out, and then I got the flu straight after that. And that, coming back from that was about when Zwift released the workout uh, module. So pretty much all of that is the um, the FTP training workout. Yeah. So when I first got onto Zwift... I managed to hook up with the World Social Rides on the weekends that Phil Rukas and John Mora run. Mm. And I was busy getting spat out the back all the time. And uh, I'd just be riding around and John being a sweeper would just be keeping me company and pulling me around and it'd just be the two of us. So that was the motivation to start the workout, to try and just be able to hang with that group. Um, so that that's worked out well. I mean, I... I there's some points in the training plan where you can do um, a free ride. So I did some with that group and it was such a hard ride that by the end of it, Swift so basically went, you need to put your FTP up by six watts. So it was definitely working. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, just, just going back a little bit, what, what kind of rider are you in the, in the real world? How much, how much cycling have you done and what, what kind of level are you at? Um, I've been cycling for a number of years. I do ride with a club, but mainly it's just um, sort of around the 40, 50 mile sort of distances. Um, I don't really get out too often. And for the last year, I've pretty much not um, been out on the bike. Yeah. So so you're a semi-serious but not incredibly fit cyclist. Is that is that probably fair? Yeah, I'm also, um, you know, I'm five foot ten and I weigh about 116 kilos. So um, let's let's talk about the the builder program. Uh, just talk me through it. I, I've seen quite a lot of feedback from people saying they found the earlier weeks much easier than they expected. Yeah, I I saw that as well on the, the UK forum. Um, I didn't. I actually struggled with week one. I some of those workouts I didn't actually complete. Um, so I found that hard. I found it perfectly pitched for me. Um, once I got to about week four to five, then it started to feel a little easy. So at that point, um, probably should have done another test to, to rebase and go from there. Mm. Once you get to week eight, nine, ten, you, you're pretty much crawling on the floor. <laughs> I, are they really hard weeks? Yeah, you get up to, um, I think it's week eight or nine i was doing 15 minute threshold intervals with hard about three to five minutes rest in between i had to repeat that week because i just couldn't do it so i took a rest week and then came back to it yeah yeah well that's a very sensible thing to do it sounds like you've been very disciplined and kind of sensible i mean did you ever feel um, and it's funny when you get on a training program, you get these terrible feelings of guilt if you if you miss a session or if you mess up a session. Did 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 that happen to you at all? When you start it, it's four times a week, 
um, and then it jumps up to five. And I, I was actually quite scared of going up to five times a week. I didn't think I was actually going to be fit enough to do it. But I found that by doing a three-day block and then a two-day block at the end that I could actually manage it. And um, it, it, I started to look forward to actually coming home from work and just getting on the bike and doing it. it it's actually really easy just to um, to keep to that schedule. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the key to it, I think, isn't it, is finding something that, that works for you. And, and you know, equally with the guilt, of course, the, the, the flip side of that is, is, as you've just talked about it, is the satisfaction of actually completing a session and thinking, yep, I've done that what's next and and i think that's one of the appeals of a program do you yeah it, it, it's definitely good because it, it does progress in difficulty as you go along and quite a lot of the rides during the week are fairly similar they're only you know a couple of minutes longer here and there but the, what you do in it is the same so if you do fail on one you're going to get a chance later in the week to to nail it a second time yeah yeah and um in general, uh, uh, what what were the what were the latter weeks like? Were they the hardest weeks, or did you feel that the fitness gains you'd already made were making those easier? They were definitely harder because I had done another, had reset my FTP based on the WSR ride, and I did do an FTP test um, when I had the rest week just to confirm that I really was at that level. Yeah. And obviously it resets the the workouts based on that so it de- they definitely build up except when you get obviously get to the sort of the the last week when it tails off ready for you to do the final test was there a time when you when it got on top of you when you thought i don't want to do this anymore not really it uh, when it's, like I said before when the you get to the 15 minute thresholds and it's like there's no way i can do three of these and but then you take a week off rest up and um come back to it and you get through it but um i, I never felt that i couldn't do any of it yeah and did you feel a, an incredible sense of satisfaction when you you you'd done the the, the 12th and final week yeah until I started the next training plan. <laughs> what, what have you gone on to? I went on to the my first century one, hmm. and that that first week of that absolutely destroyed me because the amount of time on the bike just goes up huge. You go from an hour and a half is I think the longest ride in the FTP builder, and then on the century one, the longest ride is three hours twenty in the first week. Wow, good lord! Yeah, that's a long time on a trainer. Have you have you dropped much weight? Uh, no, I am seriously struggling with the weight. Mm. Um, but that that's more my um, love of pizza than anything. <laughs> yeah, well, we all uh, we all struggle with that. Let me tell you. It, are you mainly a workout rider? I mean, presumably you don't have time to do much kind of free riding. No, um, yeah, I generally stick to the workouts unless a free ride's written into the plan. Mm, you know, I've done programmes before. I kind of like to know what I'm doing and I like to know that somebody's done all the thinking for me. Do you, do you find that appealing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I, I've tried to build my own training plans and that before, but I, it's, I come up with the same stuff each time and it's just nice to have it all there for you. Well, well listen, congratulations on your improvement. That's absolutely fantastic. And, and congratulations on having the... Uh, the discipline to stick to the programs because it's not always an easy thing to do but thank you very much for uh, having me yeah i'd encourage anybody who to do it and just stick at it and you'll definitely see an improvement right let's head to belgium When the Northern Classics start in a few days, they'll showcase that fabled figure in cycling, the Belgian hardman. These guys train outside in the wind, the rain, the sleet and the cold all year round. And what's more, they do it without even wearing gloves. Okay, not all of them, but I wondered how Zwift was being received in the land of the grizzled hard men, where cycling culture is all about being tough. Stefan Tinkgaard runs a bike shop between Brussels and Ghent. He's a dedicated Zwifter and he runs the Belgian Facebook group as well as a team called TK.be. I started off by asking him who rides Zwift in Belgium. The real racers, the most of them now are in Spain training. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, normal people, we, we can 
have a few things, but I think uh, like me, for example, I'm just a, like a tourist. Uh, I do it for fun. So yeah, what's the point of going out in the rain, in the cold, uh, not enjoying it at the moment, just to get your fitness? Some have to, uh, because uh, people of, of 20 years old who want to be a racer eventually, uh, then don't have to look at cold and they just have to ride and do their things. But when you get older, like we do, yeah, we just do it for fun, and then we go indoors now, and it's and it is fun. Yeah, Swift. yeah, no, it's it's great fun. And and it, does that mean that Zwift is being absorbed into Belgian cycling culture? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it was, I think, October uh, 2015. I started a, a Facebook page uh, called the Belgian Zwift Riders. And uh, when you see it now, a few months later, we have almost 500 uh, people on it, uh, known as tk.be on Zwift. Uh, and it are people from yeah, every kind of, of possibilities. You have very good riders on it, uh, even pros uh, in our group. But uh, you have also the normal people who just want to have fun, not busy with uh, what kind of type of training. They just want to get on the rollers, have a bit of fun watching Zwift. And you can keep it up much longer than you can do without Zwift. Uh, do serious cyclists in Belgium, not the racers and not the guys who've got to go out in the, in the rain and the cold, but you know, serious committed amateur cyclists, do they take Zwift seriously? Yeah, for sure. I'm 41 now, and I was racer uh, from my 18 to my 27 uh, until I broke my uh, kneecap. So I stopped with racing and just went to normal cycling and, and uh, enjoying it. Christophe de Grom, uh, a good mate and a friend of me, uh, also a Zwifter and uh, one of my team, he came down and said, yeah, why don't you try racing again? I was 39 at that uh, time. And I start racing again. And now I can see on Zwift uh, riders who I race with are in my TK.be team. So if you look at it, we are opponents against each other on the real roads and we are friends afterwards, but also on Zwift. Your TK.be team, you say an interesting thing about that. You say you want that to be a, like a national team for Belgium. So I wanted to have like a, yeah, the Belgium atmosphere to create it in one team. So you have, don't have to put out four watts kilo. Uh, also, you can do one watt kilo, it's also good, but one nation, one team. And yeah, you can see it because now when you log in, you can see a TK.be member and say, OK, I'm going to ride along with him. You choose him out, you ride with him and you see it growing. We have our own uh, on Sunday with your our own events, TK.be events. And uh, yeah, we started out, I think, with four guys or five guys and now like last Sunday and so we are riding with 20 people or more. I'm sure if we keep it up and the weather is keeping bad uh, in the weekends that we end up like with a peloton of 40 people or more. Our group, it never goes wrong. When I say stop, they just stop and, and that's so great. Well, that's Belgian cyclists, you see. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they must be very disciplined. They must yeah, be very we, disciplined. Th that's, that's true because we had, uh, yeah, when you're riding in our group, also, other people are following, uh, British people and, and other countries. And they just, yeah, they text us and say, wow, this is a great effort and a great pace you guys do. And, and such discipline you have. And so that's great. It gives you a, a good feeling. And uh, yeah, we just keep going. That sounds that sounds great. Now, one of the other reasons I wanted to talk to you is is, is you run a bike shop and you sell lots of uh, lovely high end bikes and you sell lots of trainers. But yeah. you've also got set up in your bike shop. You've got a Zwift station permanently set up. So you're kind of like a one man market research machine, really. What what do people what do, what what do people uh, what do people say when they when they first see Zwift? You must see a lot of those. Uh -huh. I sell a lot of trainers now, but not because I just want to sell trainers, because I want to share also the feeling. But when they come in, uh, I put them on the trainer. I get uh, the Zwift station indoors here. Uh, I show them everything. I explain everything. Uh, doesn't mind how long it takes. I just also afterwards, people are going home with the trainer and then they yeah, they text me or something from oh, this doesn't work or how do I set up this? And I just try to help us as good as I can. Well, that's that's a fantastic service. And and what do people say if they you know when they see Zwift for the first time? Are they kind of amazed or frightened or? 
No, no. Most of uh, when I put them on the trainer for like two, three minutes, the most of them are pretty well gone already. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. an e it's an easy sell. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. But maybe also because I'm passionate about it and they hear it in my voice when I'm talking and when I'm explaining all the things. But uh, it's quite an easy sell to sell uh, like Swift. Yeah. I don't think I have to sell Swift. It sells it own. Yeah. Well, Stefan, it's been absolutely terrific to talk to you. I'm really pleased to hear that Zwift is being accepted in Belgium because I would have thought Belgium was one of those places that might be a little resistant to the idea of training indoors in the warmth and the dry. But uh, that's obviously not the case. No, no, you can see it growing every week. More and more pe Belgian people are coming on to Zwift. So uh, I think it's going, uh, it's not the end yet. Yeah, excellent. And if people want to look out for those TK.be rides, that's when on Sunday morning? Yeah, most of the time we do it uh, on Sunday morning from 9 to 12, but uh, we haven't got an exact hour to ride. So we have like one team leader who is exactly at 9 o'clock at the start and finish line. And then all TK.be members can join whenever they want. And do you so have. They ride as long as they want and whenever they want. But. What I always say is, okay, you can write with us as much as you want, but TK.be sets the pace and not you. <laughs> because, yeah, that's the problem you have sometimes with other riders coming up and they uh, are going to hire the pace, yeah. which is not uh, the intention of our group. Yeah. So, But it works uh, pretty good. Sounds like a really great group to join. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, Thank Try you. it one day. I will. On Sunday. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put it in my calendar. Th Thank you for talking to me, Stefan. Yeah, it was a pleasure. See you soon. Yeah, Simon. Thank you. It's good to hear some voices from outside the English-speaking world, I think. Next episode, I'll try to track down some Swifters from the Nordic countries. But for now, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll be back with more before too long. And if you're on the trainer, come on, push a little bit harder. <laughs>